Good evening and welcome to the fastest 30 minutes in the crypto world this week in Bigfoot, the news show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community to bring you the people, places, and stories making headlines around the Bigfoot world. Then we take it and wrap it up in a nice, neat 30-minute package. If it has to do with Sasquatch, Bigfoot, or the Wild Man, you know we've got you covered. Here's what we got on tap for this week. Can skeptics be flipped into believers? It's been done more than a few times, and we'll discuss how. Mike Lucci breaks down the latest Kentucky Bigfoot trail cam photo for us, but only he can. Snow Walker hits his stride in a brand new two minutes with, and some strange footprints and trackways make headlines in Alaska. These stories and a whole lot more, so grab a drink, settle in, and brace yourself, because this one's going to get at it. Let's go. As host of This Week in Bigfoot and director of the Cats Collaboration Research Collective, I've dedicated countless hours to researching the mysterious world of Bigfoot. Trust me, I have. And throughout my career, I've been able to maintain an open-minded yet skeptical position on the subject. In my research for this week's show, I stumbled upon an article written by Brian Denning, a popular skeptical author. And I figured I'd use Mike Lucci's segment on skeptics from last week's show as kind of a springboard and lead off tonight exploring the transformative power of skepticism and open-mindedness. Dunning's article was featured in his aptly named blog, Brian's Bullshit Free Zone, on Substack.com. The two met at Cliff's North American Bigfoot Center Museum in Boring, Oregon, an assuming establishment that boasts an impressive set of exhibits designed to intrigue visitors regardless of their stance on Bigfoot. It's become Boring's one and only claim to fame. Although I've yet to visit the museum, I have done my research into Cliff and wife Melissa's creation, and I just want to say real quick that any wife that would let her husband build a museum dedicated to Bigfoot must be one hell of a woman. So Mel, here's to you. Now, the museum houses dozens of original artifacts, some which previously only existed in the pages of Bigfoot history. Cliff's charisma and unwavering enthusiasm for the subject, combined with his extensive research and personal encounters, have transformed him into a remarkable figure who effortlessly bridges the gap between skeptics and believers. Ryan's article narrates the dialogue between him and Cliff, two individuals sitting on opposite sides of the Bigfoot fence. The conversation between the two flowed effortlessly, spanning a wide range of topics. What became apparent was Cliff's unwavering belief in the reality of Bigfoot, backed by his personal encounters and thorough research. His generous sharing of experiences left Brian deeply impressed by both the depth of Cliff's knowledge and the authenticity of his convictions. Cliff Barackman, Brian went on to say, defied the stereotypical image of a Bigfoot believer. He comes off as a genuine and earnest individual who seeks to engage in open dialogue, and doesn't talk negative or run from skeptics. I Winning over Brian and so forcing him to at least consider the, the big question when you're tired. But I mean, I'm drowning in this thing and I'm kind of liking it, right? It's a lot of fun. What am I trying to do with this? Okay, well, yeah, sure, it's a business. I guess I'm trying to pay my bills, but there's a larger thing. There's a larger calling for me. The transition from skepticism to belief echoes the remarkable journey of J. Allen Hynek. The renowned astronomer who famously shifted from being a skeptic to a believer in UFOs. Hynek's transformation began in 1948, when he was enlisted by the U.S. Air Force for Project Blue Book in order to provide natural explanations for the government's backlog of UFO reports. Originally skeptical, his commitment to rigorous investigations led him to crisscrossing the country to conduct on-site investigations and have direct interactions with eyewitnesses. And over time, he evolved from a doubter to someone who acknowledged the existence of unexplained phenomena in our skies. James Randi, a celebrated magician and investigator of paranormal claims, is another prime example of such a transformation. Randi, a vocal skeptic, spent years exposing fraudulent mediums and debunking pseudoscientific practices. His famous challenge offered a substantial reward, $1 million in fact, to anyone who could demonstrate paranormal abilities under controlled conditions. However, after 2008, Randy's own journey took an unexpected turn when he encountered compelling evidence of near-death experiences and the potential existence of an afterlife. This encounter challenged his convictions, leading him to confront evidence that defied his skepticism. Randy's willingness to approach these claims with an open mind showcases the delicate balance between skepticism and the exploration of new perspectives. 
Randy's transformation underscores the significance of openness among skeptics. Remaining resolute skepticism is commendable, but refusing to budge in the face of evolving evidence can hinder personal growth and impede the pursuit of truth. This highlights the strength of skepticism when its advocates recognize the value of being receptive to new viewpoints. As director of the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective, my team and I have learned to remain open-minded when it comes to evidence claims and citing reports, and have developed the ability to critically evaluate evidence on a case-by-case basis. While critics might argue that Heineck's reliance on anecdotal evidence falls short in persuading the scientific community, his legacy as a respected scientist remains untarnished. His transition from skeptic to advocate raises crucial questions about the path from doubt to belief. The journey from skepticism to belief is intricate and unique to everyone. It requires engaging with evidence, interacting with passionate believers, and challenging one's preconceived notions. While complete conversion may not always occur, the process of exploration and open-mindedness remains essential. Skepticism is integral to critical thinking and the scientific and method. Like but for skeptics to deepen their understanding UFO to the flat. world, openness no. is paramount. Maintaining an open mind as a skeptic is not synonymous with surrendering to gullibility. Rather, it reflects a commitment to intellectual integrity and the pursuit of truth. This involves acknowledging that one's current understanding is not absolute and can evolve through exposure to new information. In conclusion, skepticism and open-mindedness can coexist harmoniously. I think you've heard me say this more than once, and I hope I don't sound like a broken record. Skepticism thrives on critical thinking and evidence-based evaluation, but an open mind is crucial for growth and understanding. Dunning's encounter with Cliff Barockman and the world of Bigfoot underscores the importance of listening, learning, and embracing the unknown. As a host and filmmaker, I am devoted to fostering discussions that celebrate both skepticism and belief, encouraging all to participate in the ongoing investigation of the extraordinary. In the pursuit of truth, skepticism and open-mindedness walk hand in hand, guiding us all towards a deeper understanding of the complex world all around us. This map here shows average rainfall levels across the United States. This here is a snapshot of the United States via the Bigfoot Mapping Project. Now, this probably won't be 100% accurate, but if we attempt to overlay these two maps, doesn't there seem to be some considerable overlap between areas with high concentrations of Bigfoot reports and rainfall? This correlation has been acknowledged in the past and could play a key role in helping us better understand the Bigfoot phenomenon. If you look where Bigfoot reports are most common in the U.S., the Deep South and Pacific Northwest, these two regions also happen to get the most rainfall out of anywhere else in the country. I looked at the 50 most recent Class A reports on the BFRO's public database where a general location and full date of the sighting were both available. I checked for rain or precipitation on the day of and 72 hours prior to each report, and in 72% of them, it precipitated in the area at least once within that three-day window. Now, this might seem like something to get excited about, but there's a very big variable here. Out of the 200 individual days I reviewed, it only rained in 59, or just 29.5% of them. For context, I calculated the average number of days it rained in cities across North America, which was about 125 days, or 34.24%, as a rough national average, meaning those 200 days I studied had below average rainfall. It's hard to compare Bigfoot reports with rainfall levels by states as a whole, since precipitation levels can vary greatly in each one. So I compared U.S. state maps of rainfall levels with Bigfoot reports and found more of that overlap. We see it here in Washington State upon comparing a snapshot of it from the Bigfoot Mapping Project with this map showing rainfall levels. Here's another example of another high volume state for reports, California. And uh, here we have Ohio. Now, there's a bit of a no shit factor here that we have to address. Most of your Bigfoot encounters are happening in or near heavily forested areas. And these are obviously greener areas because, well, they get more rain. For example, despite the Pacific Northwest having North America's only rainforest, the states in this region have diverse environments from mountains and forests to deserts and beaches. So let's look at how Bigfoot reports are distributed in some of the U.S.'s wettest states. 
In Florida, for example, you still see large concentrations of reports in or around areas that get the most rainfall. And for context, Florida is one of the top five states with the most Bigfoot reports and is also the third or fourth wettest state in the U.S. That also appears to be the case in the continental U.S.'s first and second wettest states, Louisiana and Mississippi. As you can see, there are tons of variables to consider for this theory, of which we only just scratched the surface, just to give you an idea. While largely circumstantial in nature, there is definitely enough data that seemingly points to a correlation between Bigfoot encounters and high rainfall levels. So while more research still needs to be done, the next time you're out squatching and you get rained on, while it might be tempting to pack it up and head home, the data suggests doing the exact opposite. A set of photos recently posted online have fired up the imaginations of Bigfoot believers and skeptics alike. Unusual footprints with an impressive stride have been found deep within the rugged expanse of the Alaska wilderness. Fans of the legendary creature have been excited ever since these images were uploaded to the Bigfoot Believers Facebook group by Sage Sully, host of the Sage Outcast YouTube channel. This latest set of photos marks Sully's second contribution to the group. Now, I reached out to Sully, and he did get back to me rather quick, so thanks for that. And he told me that he received these photos from his friend, Fred Roll, a member of the Crew Young Tribal Council in Dillingham, Alaska, and host of the Subarctic Sasquatch channel on YouTube. The latest set from Sully and Fred featured two new images. The first photo shows a solitary bear footprint of average size, next to human shoe prints, dog prints, and what looks like mountain bike tracks. While it does appear to sink deeper into the mud compared to the surrounding prints, unfortunately, and all too common, there's only one photo and one footprint. So, make of that what you will. The second image is undoubtedly the one that's garnered the most excitement. It shows a trackway of deep footprints appearing to be barefoot, although it's tough to tell, on a muddy trail with an impressive stride length. The length of the stride has caught the attention of enthusiasts and skeptics alike sparking discussions of the possibility of the identity of the prince owner. What I found interesting in this photo is the lack of any other prints next to the deep impressions, which means this trackway was made by an individual. An individual what, I cannot say. Among the comments that flooded in, one observer stated, that stride is impressive. Another chimed in, that's a big one. What is that stride, three or four feet? Wow! Others expressed their belief in the authenticity of the discovery, with one commenter stating, Looks legit to me. Critics, meanwhile, weighed in with their own assessments, asserting that replicating this trackway would be difficult. Sage's prior evidence includes one photo with a tape measure beside the initial set of prints, which indicates the approximate length between 12 to 13 inches. While relatively smaller compared to most Sasquatch tracks, these measurements could conceivably align with those of a human. But then again, Bigfoot creatures aren't born with size 17 or 18 inch feet, are they? As the pursuit of understanding continues, the allure of the unknown remains. And as you've seen here more than a few times, the Bigfoot Believers Facebook group delivers yet again an interesting set of footprints. So take another look at these photos, and as always, let us know what you think in the comment section. What's being described as the largest search for the Loch Ness Monster in 50 years is happening on August 26th and 27th, whose outcome could have drastic implications on Bigfoot research. The effort is being organized by the Loch Ness Center and another volunteer research team called Loch Ness Exploration. According to Loch Ness Exploration founder Alan McKenna, the Herculean effort will be the biggest search for Nessie since the now defunct Loch Ness Exploration Bureau study in 1972. McKenna says they're deploying technology never before used, like hydrophones and drones equipped with infrared cameras. In addition, teams will be stationed at vantage points around the lock to closely watch for breaks in the water, while webcams will also be live streaming, allowing people from all around the world to join the search. So let's look at this through a Bigfoot lens for a second. Especially when you take these recent UFO revelations into account, if this Loch Ness expedition is a success in any way, it could broaden the public appeal towards the possibility of other large undiscovered beings like Bigfoot actually existing. I mean, think about it. 
If they find compelling evidence of an SU-like creature in Loch Ness, a deep but enclosed area, then how much more conceivable does it make a six to eight foot tall two-legged primate living in the vast North American wilderness? We should also keep tabs on what impacts the technology they're using has on this effort as a positive outcome could make these resources more readily available to individuals or groups. Bigfoot researchers, for example, have extremely high expectations for thermal equipped drones. So what happens at Loch Ness could serve as a good indicator on what to expect. If all goes well here, it can make drone companies or anyone with access to this equipment more open to lending, donating, or even funding future Bigfoot research. Although these drones wouldn't be looking for Bigfoot on large lakes or bodies of water, you can argue Loch Ness's cavernous depths are a good equivalent to searching the stretches of vast remote wilderness where squatches reportedly live and have plenty of places to hide. Nessie settings think back over 1,500 years with modern era reports starting in the 1930s. Loch Ness Exploration reports there being over 1,100 documented Nessie sightings, with multiple already happening in 2023. I'm sure regardless of how this effort turns out, Nessie sightings will still continue, but this is something we should be closely watching, because if any compelling or indisputable evidence emerges from this, it could open a lot of doors for the future of Bigfoot research. Are you ready to uncover the mysteries of Bigfoot? Join us for SquatchCon Idaho 2023. This year, we're bringing the magic directly to your screen or join us in person. Witness the world premiere of the enhanced Paul Freeman Bigfoot footage. Doug Hycheck discovered a secret within this enhanced video you'll have to see to believe. Hear from an all-star panel of Bigfoot experts like Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, Cliff Barockman, Brian King Sharp, and Michael Freeman. Get exclusive online bonuses such as Bigfoot-themed wallpapers, a Bigfoot coloring book, an interactive Bigfoot quiz, Squatch Nut Field Guide, get a copy of the Freeman Bigfoot Files ebook, and more. Whether you attend in person or watch it live online, you'll be part of an unforgettable experience. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Secure your spot today. Squatch Con Idaho 2023. Step into the unknown. Check your watches, folks. We are officially halfway through the episode, which can only mean one thing. It's that time, folks. It's the part of the show where we give content creator Michael Merchant, a.k.a. Snow Walker Prime, screen time to speak his mind and get what's ever bothering him off his chest. Yep, you guessed it. This is Two Minutes With. into the bar and the bartender says we don't serve your kind in here and Bigfoot says what do you mean I'm a hominid and the, and the bartender says no you're too blurry you're too blurry because all the photos are blurry you can't get an ID on him he has to be 21 years old have you noticed how many Sasquatch people are dying? People die, it happens all the time. Yes, but these people have come in close contact with Sasquatch. Yeah, I know you're getting to a point here. It causes them to die, this old legends that say you don't want to whistle at them. You don't want to say their name because it'll attract them and then you'll die. Like I said, we, we all die, it's not unusual. But they're dying in clusters, there's like four of them that have, di have died in the last month. It, that's likely just a coincidence. But you don't know that, it could be, it could be because they had contact with Sasquatch. Yes, it could be, but you would need some additional collaborating evidence to establish that. I have, they were in contact with Sasquatch, I just told you that. Are you not listening to what I'm saying to you? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Yes, I know you believe they were in close proximity with Sasquatch. We haven't established that Sasquatch exists. Look, Sasquatch is real. I'm not here to debate that. We're debating whether close contact with Sasquatch causes people to die. You're right. I should be more careful. You can't debate that unless you establish that Sasquatch is real in the first place. I think the fact that all these people are dying is proof enough. That's not proof of Sasquatch. That's just proof. It's proof. It's proof. They saw Sasquatch and they died. It's just proof of their mortality. It's not proof they had contact with Sasquatch. Then why do you think they died? I, I have no clue. How would I? I thought so. 
I had the answer. You do not. They were in close proximity with Sasquatch. It happens a lot. Do you have any actual statistics to establish this? Why, once I met this guy who knew 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 this guy. I got a bunch of dead researchers. Is that statistics enough for you? Look, in any population of people, there'll there'll be deaths. People die. It happens to everybody. You're not listening to the words coming out of my mouth. These people have been in close proximity to Sasquatch, and then they died. So I walk into the bar, and the bartender says to me, we don't serve your kind here. No, you're too blurry. Is it my fault people can't focus their camera lenses? How is that my fault? No matter how much I try, I can't get any respect. People keep telling me I don't exist. Talk about gaslighting. No, you don't exist. You look blurry to me. Yeah, how does it make you feel? Just being mean. I tried, I tried. You guys are so mean. Bunch of damn internet bullies and Bigfoot haters. What do you want me to show up at the congressional hearings? Hi, I'm Bigfoot. Who knew this guy? Who knew this guy? Who knew this guy? Who knew this guy's cousin? It's time to check in with Doug Highcheck in the Legend Meets Science 2 production. So Monday, we have a lot of technicians and experts descending on the Walla Walla Deduck Springs film site where the famous Paul Freeman Bigfoot was filmed and the also the baby lift. And since everything is still there, the tree that the creature walked by, I uh, believe even the stump is still there, unchanged, we are going to be um, taking a, a very sophisticated LiDAR drone, completely gathering all the data that will be accurate within one centimeter, doing a complete survey of the area, both using the uh, LiDAR drone and a handheld um, uh, LiDAR mechanism. And then we'll take the data, turn it into a very sophisticated, accurate uh, animation, so we can see exactly like the relationship from the air where Paul was standing and the creature was. So we can show all that film happening in real time from different angles. But the most important thing is really to gauge all of the dimension of the creature, of the height, the width. You know, we can get literally joint length, everything. And um, Isaac Tian is one of the people that will be there. And he is a artificial intelligence engineer, a PhD in that topic. And he, along with Dr. Jeff Meldrum and Cliff Brockman, who is an expert on that film site, um, along with our film crew for Legend Meet Science 2, will all be there tomorrow. Are you going to be there? No, I won't be. I'll be uh, back home directing what I need to by audio or FaceTime. Ah, the the, uh, the untold radio satellite network, right? You'll be zooming down from the Correct. sky? Exactly. <laughs> because I am packing and getting ready for an Arctic trip, though, for LMS to another shoot. Well, let's tell, why don't you really brief mention broad strokes on that? Where are you heading? Heading up to the Snow Grove Lake uh, cabin location. Ah, okay. Six of us will be dropped off by float plane for seven days. It's always great catching up with Doug, and it sounds like he's got a lot going on with teams all over North America. We're working on scheduling Jeff Meldrum to stop by here soon and fill us in on his experience up there in Walla Walla, so keep an eye out for that. And remember, you can still pre-order the film by going to HangarOnePublishing.com. You know you're going to get it, you know you're going to want to watch it, so you might as well do it now and help them out in the process. And if you want to help them out even further, you can still donate to the film and get your name in the credits. That, too, can be done at HangarOnePublishing.com. And remember to stay tuned right here to This Week in Bigfoot for your exclusive access to everything that has to do with the Legend Meets Science 2 production. If it happens on the Legend Meets Science 2 production, you'll hear about it right here first. Hey, this is Chuck Larson. You're watching the CARC channel on YouTube. All right, it looks like the Bluegrass State is making back-to-back appearances on the show. Now, just in case, let us know if you recognize this image from a movie or something you saw on TV, because my search turned up nothing, and we always like to be sure on that front. This photo was cross-posted on the Bigfoot subreddit earlier this month. It was originally posted on the Skinwalker subreddit by Redditor Temp Off Road on August 7th. Although it looks like Temp Off Road, who we'll refer to as Temp moving forward, took a separate picture of the trail camera screen that took this photo, he did post the original image in a separate thread. 
And as you can see, the resolution is ridiculously low, like 150 times 84 or something like that. Temp says the quality looks weird when he tries transferring it to their phone instead of just taking a picture of it on another screen. I mean, I know lots of people out there aren't too tech savvy, but I can see why some of you might see this as a red flag. Anyway, Temp did say the area that they're in does have bad reception, so it sounds like this could have been taken by one of those trail cameras that sends images directly to your phone. Temp says this was supposedly taken on private property in Northeast Kentucky and claims there are actually more photos, which he's waiting to get from the trail camera's owner, who's reportedly an elderly relative. I tried reaching out to Kemp with more questions, but uh, still haven't gotten a response. Redditors made some interesting observations, like the figure's forearm lengths. Uh, quite a few comments suggested watching films of chimpanzees on all fours, claiming to see similarities in posture. Some even cited M.K. Davis's Junkman video as a potential example. The back stays straight. Is it on all fours? Is this on all fours right here? A few also asked about the bridge's width in the background, which Temp said was at least nine feet. One person even estimated the figure could be at least seven feet tall if the bridge was that wide. And uh, some people, yet again, think the figure in question could be carrying a small juvenile or baby. Uh, I don't know why, but this particular detail always keeps, always seems to keep coming up in uh, purported Bigfoot photos nowadays. Um, why that is, uh, it's a mystery to me. Nonetheless, I'm still keeping tabs on the different threads that stem from this photo, so I'll update you on any new developments. But until then, you got to decide for yourself if what we've got here is fact or hoax. It's time to catch you up to speed on a couple of recent Bigfoot podcasts and live streams. First in the box, Bigfoot Society returns to the list with Monday's upload, 30 Years of Bigfoot Stories with Rick Rasmore. Here, host Jeremiah speaks with Rick about sightings and encounters in the Pacific Northwest. Let's check it out. And uh, all of a sudden, one of the guys kind of stops and kind of tilts his head and asks my dad, you ever see anything in there? And so my dad kind of, I caught me off guard, this old cowboy saying this, and we're out in the high desert of Southeast Oregon. We're 200 miles from Bigfoot country. And he just kind of stepped forward. You ever see anything in there? Weird or something? My dad, my dad kind of takes a second and goes, you mean Bigfoot? And again, my dad's not a believer by any means, but just how he even responded that way, I, I, I expect he probably would, especially with a question like that being asked. Yeah. And so the guy goes on to tell us and they talk, they know Paul Freeman, uh, both these ranchers. He's done some work with the ranches over the years. So he's just kind of big old, easy going, happy, go lucky guy. And uh, said that they had been approached back in those days by some researchers of some sort. I don't remember specific. I mean, they were Bigfoot research, but what their credentials were, I don't recall. But I can't remember both the cowboys or one of them had, but they or they had been in touch with these cowboys. There this cowboy slash cowboys wanted them to take these researchers into the Wino to Canyon Wilderness. So one of the cowboys did take them in and took them into the canyon I was referring to earlier, where I had this weird, this weird eerie sensation. My dad and I, where we heard the, the there smelled the stench the year later. They took these researcher guys into the bottom of that canyon. Coincidentally, and then I and I remember this is a, this is the word for word thing. Cowboy looks at my dad and says, "As sure as I'm standing here, that thing exists." Wow. Next up, it's Colorado Bigfoot, and the latest from the dynamic duo. The guys find some rather large fingerprints on their vehicle while investigating in their research area. Let's take a look. <laughs> Let me see. It's happened to me and Cali before. But at nighttime, remember that incredible design he did on the back? I don't know what that is. Like, what is that? Oh, that's the fingers. But it, might, that? but it might be a person. Oh, look at that. That, that is no, weird. What is that, bro? Ain't nobody been on my truck like that. That's what I said. That is weird. That as is weird. weird. I like that. That ain't been there. I mean, it looks like someone maybe opening the door, but... Like... <laughs> what the That's fuck a big are we hand. Doing? Look how long the oh yeah, look at that. What are we doing? Oh look how long that is. What are we doing? That what just happened now. Bro, I'm telling you, I walk back up to the car and I say, do, do, do. Can you do that again? And I say, what is that? <laughs> yeah, because here's fingers 
like sort they, of the same thing, see, but look how yeah. short they so are. So you see how my fingers would be opening the tank. That's like six inches long. What the? That is like not even. Dude, you might have something there. Batting cleanup this week, it's the Buckwash Crew, episode 112, Bluff Creek Massacre Theory, featuring the research of Bill Miller and Tom Steenberg. Here the guys discuss M.K. Davis's controversial Bluff Creek Massacre Theory. Let's listen in. In one of his emails, Pilates attached some images to John Green that were not of the P.G. film as he had mistakenly thought, but rather from the René de Hinden film taken during Green's return visit to Bluff Creek in late August of 1967. It appeared that Pilates may have been unaware that the old film he had told Hodgson about coming into possession of was actually the edited version of DeHinden's film on Blue Creek Mountain that had been attached to a copy of Patterson's film for public showing purposes and other venues. I still find myself wondering how anyone could think that the two films, DeHinden's and Patterson's, were shot at the same time. The facts was that the lush green scenery of late summer in DeHinden's film compared to the deepened redfall colors seen in Patterson's film is quite discernible. Needless to say that Green wasn't impressed with the accusatory remark Pilates made to Hodgson on July 15, 2009. It looks like the leaves on the sugar maple behind my house are slowly starting to turn red. That can only mean one thing, fall can't be far behind. That being said, there's still only one guy week after week we all turn to to keep us up to speed on the who's, the what's, and the where's, and that's Chuck Larson with another great show in this week's Spotlight. Sixth Annual Bigfoot Day, August 19th, Hiller, PA, Conference Spotlight. For well, this week's Conference Spotlight, we're headed back to Pennsylvania one more time to Patsy Hillman Park in Hiller, PA for the 6th Annual Bigfoot Day, presented by the Fayette County Pennsylvania Bigfoot Project. This event has free admission and starts at 10 a.m. and runs until 5, this Saturday, August 19th. Learn Bigfoot search techniques, hear reports of local Bigfoot encounters, or report your own Bigfoot encounter. Fred Saluga and newly added Bill Rigby headline speaker presentations which run all day. Bigfoot, UFOs, and paranormal, there will be something for everyone. This family-friendly event will have food, vendors, and more. All proceeds from the event benefit Patsy Hillman Park. So if you're looking for a fun day that benefits a good cause, head over to Hiller, Pennsylvania this Saturday. For more information, go to the Festival Facebook page. And that's this week's Conference Spotlight. Brendan, back to you. Thanks, Chuck. Okay, folks, looks like we're once again all out of time for this week's show. Episode 24 is now in the books. We are officially halfway through Season 1. I'd like to thank you for watching and remind you to like and share everything we do here at the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective. Tell your friends. It's very important to the success of the channel and the success of This Week in Bigfoot. We couldn't do it without you. And if you have any questions or comments or maybe something you'd like to see us cover on the show, you can always drop us a line at This Week in Bigfoot Newscast at gmail.com. So, until next week, for Mike Lucci and Chuck Larson, I'm Brendan Brown, reminding you that when it comes to getting your Bigfoot news, be informed, not biased. Take care.